here we go. Uh, again, I, th I think this is going to help with the in-class activity that you're working on. I mean, the, uh, the at-home activity you're working on now. More about recruiting, forecasting, and planning. Uh, really kind of embodies the concept of needs assessment as it relates to recruiting efforts. Uh, by the way, that's the cover of your book uh, that, that most of you likely didn't buy. But much of this is taken from uh, the book, and you'll see because uh, the slides that are being credited to the book uh, deserve the credit that they get. So what are we about uh, after, after uh, looking at this video? We should be able to describe the workforce planning process, describe how organization can predict its future business activity, describe how an organization can forecast its demand for workers. Can, can you imagine right now with the shutdown we're experiencing as a result of the pandemic, what this means and what this looks like? Uh, to what extent might you have a contingency as someone who is in charge of human resources for a hospital? What is your contingency plan for a potential pandemic, for example? That's, that's a huge kind of issue uh, as we see today. Uh, we have locations that are, uh, New York just asked, hey, if you're a retired nurse or you're a retired doctor, come on back and uh, volunteer or, or however we're going to do it to, to meet the needs. So, uh, you know, contingency planning is kind of where it's at. Not that it will happen, but what if it does happen? What do we have in place to help us meet the challenge uh, proactively? rather than we've met the challenge in this case is amazingly reactively. There's been almost no proaction. It's been uh, kind of poster uh, <laughs> poster for being unprepared, etc. Uh, okay, so enough of that. Explain how uh, to forecast the likely supply of available workers from inside and outside the firm, and that leads to are we going to hire, are we going to train uh, again. Uh, discuss how to develop action plans to address gaps between labor supply and labor demand and then describe your general staffing process. So, uh, the av availability talent needed to execute a desired business strategy will influence whether or not the strategy is ultimately successful. So, if we're going to meet the needs of a pandemic, what do we have? Do we have doctors and we ha do we have nurses available in the, the quantity necessary? There's been a lot of talk about respirators, pro uh, personal protective equipment, all that stuff is necessary, but the people who wear that, we might argue, are even more necessary than the materials uh, themselves. Workforce planning, a process of predicting the organization's future employment needs, the availability of current employees, and external hires to meet those employment needs and execute the organization's strategy. Workforce planning is the foundation of strategic planning. Uh, strategic staffing because it identifies and addresses future challenges to a firm's ability to get the talent, the right talent, in the right place at the right time to successfully execute a strategy. And again, I'm going to go back to the idea of contingency planning. This isn't one way to do this. This is, hey, we have five or six approaches depending on the circumstances that we're facing at any given time. So, one, identify the business strategy. What's the process, right? Identify the business strategy. Two, articulate the firm's talent philosophy and strategic staffing decisions. We've already kind of talked about talent philosophies way back at the beginning of the course. Conduct a workforce analysis. That's kind of a new topic is who do we have, what are their capabilities, uh, and things like promotion maps. What, what is our potential with our existing people? Four, develop, implement action plans, right? Develop action plans that address the gaps between labor demand and labor supply forecasts. Notice how ONET can be a real benefit there. Is it a hot occupation? If it's a hot occupation, you better get competitive, right? Uh, because that means that uh, a lot of people might need folks with these skills, and they may become increasingly valuable as a result of that. We can also consider that maybe there are people who have skills, right, that are not necessarily what's needed now, and they're in a profession where the outlook isn't so bright, but are they trainable easily to the new skills that we might desire, and we might target recruitment to those areas looking back at our last lecture. Uh, action plans can be short-term, they can be long-term, uh, depending on the firm's needs and uh, the predictability of the uh, environment. You know, if we're talking about kind of long-term business trends, that is, forms one kind of planning. But back to the pandemic, if we're talking about short-term instances uh, 
then, then maybe we have a contingency that allows us to operate on that short-term basis. We monitor, evaluate, revise the forecasts and the action plans to the extent we're able to. Obviously, we can't prepare necessarily as well as we'd like to for surprises or things that may not happen. Probabilities enter into those, that decision making as well. But as the environment changes, forecasts and action plans need to change as well. So it's kind of a living document. It's not something that's fixed in stone. We have to be flexible and we have to be ready to move. What was necessary before might not be necessary in the future. So remember talent philosophy. It's a system of belief about how employees should be treated. And, and you know, we go back, way back to early lectures and talking about that. You can go ahead and read that. I'm not going to belabor those points. Now, the workforce planning process then, as you can see, identify the firm's talent philosophy and strategic staffing goals, and that's informed by the business strategy, right? Forecast the firm's demand for labor, forecast the supply of the labor. Identify gaps, right? Where are the shortages and where are the surpluses? And understand those. And like I said about the surpluses before, that might be a nice recruiting area if surpluses in another area are easily trainable to shortages in a different area. Develop action plans, and that might be an action plan that you develop. Wow, how would we move these people from the current job to a different job, and what might that take, right? Or do we need to hire from the outside? Monitor, evaluate, revise, and ref uh, the forecast plans as necessary. So just a nice overview there. So create a sourcing plan. Profile desirable employees to identify promising sources. Right? Identify what desirable, talent, successful, current employees and targeted jobs like to do and how you might reach them if you were to recruit them now. Using surveys, focus groups, what have you, ask where do they like to go, what media do they use, what organization do they belong to, what events do they attend, what websites, other sources would they use if they were to look for another job. Notice, we can use our own incumbents and we can query them as to where we would be likely to find people like them. Okay? So that's a, a tremendous resource we have available to us. Two, perform ongoing recruiting source effectiveness analysis. Okay? Where applicants discovered the vacancy. So where did they see about the job? Where top candidates discovered the vacancy might be different than applicants in general. right? So be prepared to separate those two out and, and look at the differences between the two groups if there's any differences that exist. How many recruits at each source were generated? So this is just back to the record keeping we stressed so much over the period of the course, but especially in the last lecture. Okay? And, and you can see the statistics that go on down. Uh, one, I think, is the yield ratios for each source we mentioned last time, job performance by source, and if we look at job performance by source, now we're really into the idea of longitudinal tracking. Look, I found this person here. I keep a record of that. I follow them through our employment. We have measures that are measuring their uh, performance longitudinally, and we can then trace it back. Where did we find the highest performers, right? But this takes a, a good system of longitudinal measures, right? Job performance by source, promotion rates by source, data relevant to other staffing goals as necessary. <clears throat> all, all of these are components that we can look at. So let's, let's take a, an example, and again, this is, this is from your book, right? So recruiting source effectiveness analysis. So we can look at, hey, what's the average speed of recruitments bringing people in? What was the cost to hire these people, and what was the new hire quality? Keeping records like this then allows us to invest money in our recruiting efforts where we get the most bang for the buck. So we see in this example, college hiring, hey, it was not a quick way to do it. We look at an average speed of eight months. The price was kind of mid-range, about 5,500 bucks per hire, but the quality of the hire was very high, right? So if our business or our talent philosophy is long-term, we're looking for longevity and we're looking for growing people, into our organization, then you can see that that's a pretty attractive option, right? Now for short term, we might use search firm or career sites, right? We can see that the speed is half of or less, right? And we can see that the cost, especially for like career sites, is 2,500 bucks, and the new quality hire is good, right? And so it's not very high, but it's good. And for a short term talent philosophy, or if we're looking to just kind of fill positions, 
uh, and not necessarily grow people, this might be the approach we want to take. No. Metrics. Assume you hire two new people for the same job and position. Which hiring process was more effective? So, and this is a little program, uh, problem that you can figure out. The time to fill was three months, right, for person A. The time to, uh, for person B was five months. The cost to recruit was 6500 bucks and $12,600 for person B. Annual salary, a little lower for person A than person B. What do you think? What is the better option? Well, I think most of us might point to, look, hey, uh, person A, that is the recruiting system we use to pull in person A, seems to be a lot more efficient in terms of time, and it seems to be of lower cost overall. It might be the better bet then, given just what we're presenting as far as data here. There might be other factors that then would make us revisit this and think about it differently. Okay. Now, cost versus investment. What, would your answer be the same with this additional information as I was alluding to? Okay. So, time to fill, person A, three months, six months, notice all the figures are the same, but now let's add new information. First year revenue generated, well, this person A, or people within category or process A, if you want to blow it up like that, $330,000, but person B, $442,000. Second year revenue, notice, slight increase, tremendous increase there. Turnover, person A was out of there in 26 months, look at person B is still there. High potential, no, yes. So depending on the factors you want to measure, your evaluation of your recruiting system may differ. The thing is that you have to use metrics that lead you to the best outcomes. So determine what you learn, and if you're using metrics that don't really satisfy your goal, then what do you do? You develop new metrics and you start tracking those as well. Okay. So creating a sourcing plan, we're only on step three, believe it or not. Prioritize recruiting sources based on staffing goals and employer profiles. Prioritize recruiting sources based on staffing goals and the results of the recruiting source effectiveness analysis, the previous slide. Referring to the last slide, if quality is more important, college hiring would be the preferred source. If hiring speed is more important than quality, employee referrals would be given priority to source needed for engineers. So understand what we're trying to do, what is the ultimate philosophy. As, as the hiring resource professional, you're probably going to be getting the overall philosophy from a manager, a general manager, uh, up to a vice president or CEO of an organization. And forecasting. Given the uncertainty of forecast, construct estimates as range. So we don't provide a single forecast. We provide multiple forecasts. We try to figure out and assign probabilities to them based on circumstances we might, might encounter. So we might have low probable and high estimates, and, but, but also do it in a range rather than a single number. Recalculate estimates as changes happen to the organization's internal and external environments and as the firm's assumptions and expectations change. And notice, if we have a big turno, uh, big change in leadership in the organization, then we may have to revisit this substantially. Now, forecasting business activity. Product demand directly affects its need for labor. For example, when I worked at the lumber mill in Northern California, they operated, as I've mentioned to you before, a layoff pool. What they really do is they have perhaps 10 to 15 percent more employees on the books than they need at their minimum or their slack time. But as demand ramps up, and it was seasonal, so we have seasonal here, for example, when is lumber needed to the greatest extent? When people are building. When do people start building? They start building in the early spring typically, right? Unless it's a year-round climate, but in, in a lot of cases the demand is highest in the early spring. So what we would typically see is come November we would often be laid off up to a month or a month and a half, which really sucked being uh, <laughs> given your layoff notice around Thanksgiving and know that you will not have any work uh, with the organization through December. But come January, they hire you back and you could expect by February, well, probably by March to be working overtime. 
kind of a feast or famine situation to fill the higher demand at that point in time for construction materials. Different organizations are going to function differently. If you want to get a job at a winery, when should you go to look for a job at a winery? You should look for a job at a winery probably in August because what you're doing is you're approaching harvest time uh, and that's when things are going to get really busy is when all the grapes are coming into the winery, the crush is going on, and then through the winter months there's still a lot of work for bottling uh, and, and, and other functions within, within the winery. And that's where I used to work in November and December when I would get laid off at the lumber mill. So funny that I moved to Northern California so that I could work at a winery. I didn't get hired at any wineries so I ended up having to work at a lumber mill just to support us. And then I end up working at a winery, so go frickin' figure. You, you need to plan better than I did, let's put it that way. Locate reliable, high-quality information sources within and outside the organization to forecast business activity. What do you think? Who would have forecasted that uh, making respirators, right, or, or making PPE would be so important at this point in time, right? Uh, that would probably be one that would be difficult to forecast, but... If you think about it, if we knew about COVID-19 back in December, which we did, astute organizations uh, that are effective planners might have started ramping up their PPE stuff uh, back in December and January, and then we would not be hitting the supply hitch. Uh, let's face it, a lot of American business is not very proactive, it's very reactive, as our government's role in this has been, has been extremely reactive rather than proactive. So we're always kind of like running two steps behind to try and catch up to the needs. Uh, have a contingency that allows you to jump in ahead of time. Okay. So other, uh, other uh, forecasts, interest rates, uh, currency exchange. Uh, if, if you're operating a realty company, how many realtors do you need when you see interest rates starting to drop? What interest rates starting to drop means home loan uh, rates are probably going to drop and that might increase then uh, potential to sell houses in the market. Currency exchange. Uh, competitors. What are competitors doing? Is a competitor going away and maybe opening up business? Industry and, uh, and other economic factors. Uh, so, but, but these become very domain specific so you have to know your own business or be able to talk to people in the business who can help you with that. It's a good idea to identify minimal as well as optimal staffing levels when analyzing labor demand. What's the minimum we can get by with? How many is too many? A lot of firms then, especially with low-level jobs, hourly jobs, operate layoff pools. The paper mill does this. The, the lumber mill does this. Construction does this. Uh, so that they have that buffer, they can bring in 10% more of the workforce as the season demands it or, or general business demands. Uh, the organization's demand for labor on its forecasted business activity is business needs which depend on business strategy. Business needs can include things like uh, achieving the staffing levels necessary for generating giving the amount of revenue within a particular period of time. Right? So you may have sp specific goals that drive specific numbers of people needed to achieve those goals. You might increase staff levels. You say, hey, we want to grow this segment of our business, so we're going to increase staff levels. Uh, we might restructure and say, wow, it looks like we're going to maybe merge and then restructure. We've got to start looking at downsizing these areas. Certainly, we're not going to hire into these areas. And then we may need to obtain new talent uh, to create new products or provide different services within an organization. We're going to do some kind of new business, and we need to, in fact, then change as a result. So. Ratio analysis is a metric we can use as soon as there's a relatively fixed ratio between number of employees needed and certain business metrics. So we can use historic uh, patterns within the firm to help establish a reasonable range for these ratios. Uh, and, and this process can be used to either justify new position or demonstrating the need for layoffs. That is, historically we've seen that X number of people are required to manufacture this amount of product. We intend to manufacture this amount of product or increase the amount of product or decrease the amount of product. The staff to product or productivity ratio then can, can be consulted to determine how our workforce is, is presenting as a surplus or a shortage. But we need consistent historical trends to calculate ratios and, and quite often there are environmental circumstances that differ that, that might make using historical uh, ratios 
uh, not as precise as we would hope that it could be. So, possible ratios that we might discuss then, hey, production to employees. Okay. And notice how this changes as, as we automate various businesses, let's say auto manufacturing, production to employees can change drastically. So that's an environmental circumstance that can change this. But all else being equal, what is our, uh, our, our production demand and then based on historic figures, how many people do we need to accomplish that? Or maybe it's a revenue per employee. And this might be more in a sales type industry uh, than a manufacturing industry. Another ratio might be managers to employees. Now, historically, this one, this one has shifted a great deal. Uh, if you look in the, in the 80s and 90s, uh, when there's downsizing, managers that were attacked. So middle managers, it's like, oh my God, we have so many middle managers. Do we really need this many, many middle managers? And there was a conscious then decision to change the ratio of management to line workers, so to speak. So, uh, but all else being equal. Another possible ratio is inventory levels to employees. Uh, if it's an industry that it, where inventory is important. Number of customers or customer orders to employees, then uh, labor costs to production costs, uh, the percent utilization of production capacity to the number of employees. Uh, these are all uh, ratios that can be used to better inform our hiring or recruiting needs uh, in the future. And then scatter plots. Okay, we look at this then as an example. Let's bring in a little of what we know. Uh, what is the correlation? What is the relationship? If an area has a population of 44,000, then eight ambulance drivers would be predicted to be needed. But what happens if the population increases to 60,000? Then you can see we probably need 10 ambulance drivers. So kind of in a, in a city type staffing situation, we can make plans, uh, we can look at population growth and predict the number of police officers, new police officers we may need to hire. Trend analysis simply uses past employment patterns to predict future needs because so many factors can affect staffing needs, including competition, the economic environment, etc. Trend analysis is not a sole go-to. It's usually a component in a bigger calculation. Okay, I think we're going to run out of time on part one here, so let's call this good and uh, we'll get back to part two uh, at our leisure. Oh. Let's take a look at trend analysis here, and you can see these are domestically educated, internationally educated, but let's move on from there. Okay.